All right, welcome. My name is Ariella Daly, and this is the first of a ongoing lecture series I'll be doing every month called Kindred Bees. And it comes from the idea that we are in relationship and can be in greater relationship with the more than human world. So approaching the bees as kindred spirits and a part of our greater kith and kin is one of the ways that we can start to heal the rift that we often all feel within ourselves between what we might call the human experience and the natural world. There are many ways into healing this rift. Bees for me is the way that I started to weave myself back into greater relationship with what we could call nature or the more than human world, although we are nature <laughs> as well. Um, and I don't think bees are the only way. This is just one avenue through which we can start to deepen into our relationship to all that is. And the reason I start with this topic, bees is a bridge restoring our relationship to honeybees, which of course is the topic for today, is because I believe that we need to look at relationships and how we relate before we look at how to do something. So I'm a beekeeper, I teach beekeeping, and a lot of beekeeping information out there is about how to keep bees. If you've taken classes with me before, you've heard this little spiel. It's about how to keep bees. But all of our understanding about how to keep bees, if we look at it from a um, perspective of, of what's readily available, what's easily accessible, is based on mechanized beekeeping, commercial beekeeping, and perceiving the bees as something that we have, a commodity that we can extract from. It's looking at bees through the capitalist mind, through the patriarchal mind, and uh, through the mind of human dominance over other creatures. And so we don't look at them and ask the question of why, why, why are they the way they are? Why are they, um, you know, why are they dying? What's going on? What's happening? Uh, what's their relationship to the flowers? What's their relationship to the moon? What's their relationship to ourselves? What's their relationship to the trees? Who are they? And when we ask the questions of why and who and seek to have relationship, whether or not you ever see, want to become a beekeeper, this is not about that. Um, when we do that, though, we, we start to shift and change our worldview. And perhaps pick up some of the threads that were dropped, lost, forgotten, um, oppressed, severed to those ancestors that are in all of our lineages that lived in an earth honoring way and had intimate relationship with the more than human world, with the rivers and the stars and the bees and the bears, and the snakes, and the rocks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I see honeybees as a way in, as a doorway into that relationship. And I'll talk about why further on in the lecture. I love pictures. So this will be a lecture with lots of pictures. Um, and it's all recorded. So if you drop out or if anything happens, you can come back and watch the recording later. Uh, there's about 200 of you of those signed up, so I expect a lot of you receiving the recording after those who aren't able to make it to the live session. So let's jump in and see what comes. I generally like to plan my lectures loosely and see what happens. I'm a tangential type, so we will see if I can get through the whole thing. Um, we might end up, I don't know somewhere far, far, far from Kansas. So I have no idea what's going to happen, but I have a plan. And I think that's how the bees are anyway. They have a plan, but then life continues to unfold. So here we go with the share. Hmm. If you aren't familiar with this aspect of Zoom, you can toggle over my, um, let me just make sure that that's there. You can toggle over the right side of the screen and uh, shift the midline 
to the side or to the middle so you can either have me um, bigger or smaller you don't really need me to be that big even though i talk a lot with my hands uh, the slides will hopefully support you so today's theme as a kickoff is bees as a bridge restoring our relationship to honeybees and i always like to start here our relationship and the restoration of our relationship with bees, which is really the restoration of our relationship with the earth, is, uh, let me just keep letting people in, hold on, I have to do this, <laughs> hold on, I gotta figure out how to work the controls as people come in. There we go. Okay, I think I can pull that off. All right. Um, our relationship with bees begins as a love affair. And I mean that because, or our restoration, sorry, I got thrown by trying to let people in because I need an admin. <laughs> okay, uh, welcome to those of you just joining us. To change how we live on Earth and with the planet as it's going, we all know that things aren't going so well at the moment, um, that there is a lot of restoration that is needed. There's a lot of uh, rewilding that's needed. There's a lot of healing of the waters, of the soil, of the plants. All of this needs to come or will most readily come if we love. So if we fall in love, we're going to be a lot more likely to want to do something about all of this. And all of you are here because at some point you had that first little ping of interest in the bees, that little call to, to fall in love. And there is something about bees, you know, I see it again and again and it happened to me. They are utterly fascinating and they draw us in. They've been associated with love for a very, very long time, both romantic love and that greater, um, what we could call like mother love, that big, big, all encompassing love for existence. And they are incredibly devotional beings to each other because they're all part of one organism. So they help us connect with that sense of being part of something greater and being part of something being in a unified whole i don't want to romanticize things too much i don't want to just say bees equal unity um i don't want to reduce everything that they are to human understandings but this this are human relational like bees are unity or bees are love i i get that 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 is a wonderful way to start to think about them they are more complex than that and yet our relationship to them when we fall in love, when we get entranced by them, when we get fascinated by them, we, we want to know more, we want to lean in, and it's that leaning in that starts to beckon us and, and ask the question of who are they, um, why are they, how can we support them better, because they are clearly ringing the bells quite loudly, saying we're not okay because you're not okay. And you're not okay because we're not okay. And what are we going to do about it? Bees are very, very old. Uh, they will figure out how to continue to adapt, but they're really struggling right now. And I'm not a big proponent of the campaign Save the Bees. I think it's it's more like let's return to, let's save each other. <laughs> let's be in relationship to the bees. Let's see what they're trying to teach us as I don't think we can come in on our white horses and save all the harm we've done if we aren't actually looking at what, what our relationship is to the natural world, to the bees, to ourselves. So I think the bees are telling us to save ourselves and in, in the process they will be quote unquote saved. Although I think it's again, not quite the right languaging to use. If you hang out with me long enough, you'll know I get uh, real hung up on language and how to talk about things because language informs our worldview. So how old is this fascination, this relationship with bees? When did it start? You'll find later in the lecture, I'll talk a little bit about uh, how bees may have, and in fact, very probably helped us evolve into the human beings we are today, quite literally. But in terms of the historical record and the science behind bees. Bees have been around for over 130 million years. They uh, diverged from wasps 
a while back, a long while back, when wasps, uh, certain species of wasps started to gather pollen from flowers and bring them back to their larva rather than, uh, you know, flies and other insects. And uh, if you want to read more about that, there's a great chapter called The Vegetarian Wasp in uh, Thor Hansen's book, The Buzz About Bees. The kind of honeybee that we think of when we think of beekeeping in the Western world is Apis mellifera. So this is the bee that we see in bee boxes. This is the honeybee that's um, that we hear about all the time. And of course, it's been um, through colonization and, and all, all other other things. It's been brought all over the world. So we find um, this honeybee in many different places, including the beekeeping that happens in the Americas. There was a kind of apis in the Americas. Um, fossil records were found in Nevada, but that was a very, very long time ago before humans, from what I understand. So apis mellifera, which means the honey gathering bee. Um, apis actually means bull because bees were seen to have been born of the bull. That's a whole nother topic, but the bull is um, very connected to regeneration, life and death, and the ancient um, goddess culture of places like Minoan Crete and other parts of the ancient world. So Apis mellifera is just one species of bee. There are eight others and most of them exist. In fact, I think all other eight exist in Asia and there is a form of, there's beekeeping over there with those types of bees. So this isn't the only type. And I think that's important to recognize um, because Again, we have to look at the legacies of harm. And one of the legacies of harm is, of course, colonization and beekeeping. It, the way we keep bees and Avis mellifera is all over the world because of colonization. That isn't a negative thing in the sense that bees are wonderful all over the world. They do a wonderful job. And our crisis with bees brings, us, brings attention not just to bees, but to native pollinators, solitary bees, uh, other species of bees, but it's important to just recognize why Apis mellifera is the one we're talking about and why it's all over the world. My area of specialty is in um, European f folklore and history around Apis mellifera. Uh, I haven't studied other countries quite as much, so I won't be talking about other regions as much, but I wanted to preface that and, and just touch on that because it's really important to to notice and it's it shows up in our language we call it the western honeybee or the european honeybee or um i think there's one other that i can't remember but we have to acknowledge as well that it, it didn't necessarily start in europe that the it's believed that this bee actually came out of asia or africa and migrated to central europe Beekeeping in Central Europe has been around a long time, but, it, but it's the first record of beekeeping, as in putting bees into a cavity, an artificial cavity, uh, was, is shown, I'll come back to that, in ancient Egypt. So we'll come to, that, come to that in a second. Prior to beekeeping, putting bees inside an artificial cavity and then harvesting their honey and possibly their larva and their pollen, because didn't just eat honey. Uh, the first uh, we, we see, uh, sorry, what was I trying to say? Prior to beekeeping, there was uh, honey hunting and honey hunting still exists today. But this is a picture of one of the oldest depictions of honey hunting. And it's in Spain at the cave of spiders. You see, if you were to see the entire image, that ladder goes down quite a ways. So this was clearly um, a dangerous endeavor going up a long ladder to get to a hollow where there is a nest of bees and you can see that the person there is surrounded by bees and carrying a basket and accessing the nest. Uh, one of the things I love that I've heard some of my colleagues say is that is referencing this as a her or a she. Uh, we often immediately assume that that would be a man and we have no way of knowing if that's actually true. So we will look at her as the first, one of the first depictions of a honey huntress. Why not? Of course, maybe they didn't even identify in those types of ways. So it's just fun to 
try and shift how we perceive the distant past. Moving along, we come to the first, oh, what is going on? There we go. We come to the first written accounts of beekeeping. And beekeeping in ancient Egypt was done in these long cylindrical tubes that were all stacked one on top of the other. You actually can still see that going on today. They were clay tubes and it was a thriving industry. It was a major part of the culture. It was one of their forms of currency. They didn't have currency the way we do. Um, it was more of a system of trade. And so honey was a major part of bees and beekeeping in ancient Egypt. In fact, uh, Lower Egypt was called like the land of the bees, and the pharaoh was often pharaoh was often called the king bee. The Greeks and the Egyptians did not know that the mother bee, the biggest bee, was a mother, was a queen, and so they called it the king. Um, so that's where you get the king bee. So there is a lot you can find in hieroglyphics the and and art the depiction of bees and beekeeping i don't have a slide of it but there's another wonderful depiction um at one of the temples of the sun of a of the of various seasonal activities and one of them is is their seasonal activity of harvesting honey um, how they would harvest honey and we can collect it from the bees and then set it out in the sun and separate the honey from the beeswax and so forth and so on. So honey was one of the primary ways that people sweetened their food, but more importantly, it was used in medicine. And we know that uh, looking at the pap um, papyrus records or there's records of medicinal use in ancient Egypt. So uh, that hasn't changed. Honey is still used to this day. In fact, you can um, find its use in many modern day hospitals, dress, dressing wounds, dressing burns, et cetera, et cetera. So we have the first archeological records in Egypt's fifth dynasty of the old kingdom. The other place to look, so we don't just look for bees if we're trying to understand who were the bees in ancient history and what was our relationship to them, because that's, that's where I'm sourcing right now. I'm looking back in time to also restore my relationship to bees now. So the other place we look besides honey is beeswax. These were the two major commodities we could call them or two major aspects of the hive that people used and therefore associated with um, in a sacred way. So it was used in a practical way and also in a sacred way. Honey became a sacred substance, so did beeswax. So there are records of beeswax being used at least 8,000 years ago in Europe, the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, one of the oldest records is in, I believe, what is modern day Israel, where uh, the beeswax was used for making wax castings for, stat for like statuary and stuff like that. So people have held the bees as sacred beings since our earliest records. And let's see, I just want to make sure that I got this. Hang on, oops, okay, I didn't, that didn't work. Um, I will go back to my screen. Look at me, messing things up. Next time I'll have to use two computers. Hold on one second. Welcome everyone who is here uh, that, that just came on. Good to have you here. Okay, back to here. So people have been using bees as their sacred beans since our earliest records. Um, and we find this to be true, especially in relationship to goddess culture, ancient mother goddesses in places like Greece and Anatolia. And I will touch on that again. Crete was the home of Minoan, the Minoan civilization. And the Minoan civilization was where we have the first uh, records of beekeeping in Greece, because Minoan, the Minoan civilization was, it was predated Greek classical Greek civilization. Ugh, civilization. So the Minoans taught the Greeks beekeeping, and the Minoans had a name for certain priestesses dedicated to certain goddesses in that 
land, and that name was Bees or Melissa. Honey became a major offering. You'll find it throughout many different um, stories and myths connected to ancient Greece, Rome, and other cultures. And this is an example to all the gods, honey, to the mistress of the labyrinth, honey, a tablet from Gnosis, Greece, Crete. Remember that Gnosis was where the um, labyrinth was built and where we have the story of Ariadne and the Minotaur. So just to give you a brief overview, here's a small list there. It is larger than this of some of the gods and goddesses or the divine throughout the ancient world that were associated with bees or were actually gods of the bees. So you have your Egyptian gods, um, male and female, again, your Greek gods, male and female, your Minoan, your Roman, Lithuanian, um, Nordic, Celtic, Christian. You have a number of saints. I was just reading about um, two beekeeping saints in um, from the from the Ukrainian Catholic culture yesterday, and their patronage over the bees. So there's there are a number of other saints connected to bees. This is again a short list, but I just wanted to give you a sense of how many different divine beings were connected to or associated with bees, and we'll talk about why. Well, let's get back to modern day times. So while in gen the general population may not hold bees as sacred in our current worldview, because our current worldview is, is based on, in terms of bees, our current wor worldview is informed by the industrial revolution, extraction, and mechanization. Uh, nonetheless, we are still fascinated and entranced with bees. And you see that, if you've been paying attention, you probably see that in how popular bees are and beekeeping is all of a sudden in the last 10 to 15 years. It got very, very popular. Uh, the popular slogan, Save the Bees. Our fascination in terms of science and the amount of studies out there around bees, around apotherapy and the use of bee products for healing and health, around how to preserve the bees, around what's killing the bees, etc., etc., etc. We are very, very fascinated with bees. And this fascination is across the board. So I may be coming from a place of you know, deep fashion fascination in the sacred nature of bees throughout history and time and my own spiritual connection to bees as well as my own physical and emotional connection to bees but you don't have to have any of that going with for you to, and still have this love affair and still have this fascination and i think that's really important so that we don't just demonize people who are perhaps deeply enmeshed in um, the rather abusive patterns of mechanized commercial beekeeping i mean it's not great What's going on right now, today, for the next few weeks in California is not great for the bees. I'll talk about what that is in just a second. However, that doesn't mean that all the people involved, all the beekeepers involved don't actually love their bees or have a deep fascination or feel a connection. It doesn't mean all of them do have that as well. It's just we're, we're complex humans. We're complex beings. So let's just acknowledge that there's this real ferocity of love that shows up when people get into bees and it can look different for different people. So if you've ever been to a beekeepers association um, and gone to one of the meetings and been perhaps someone who's maybe a natural beekeeper or just starting out and you get this sort of intense vitriol from established beekeepers or um, more often than not sort of the good old guys club of, of I, I love male beekeepers, but it can get pretty intense sometimes with, with the, um, with the, with the guys, uh, there, it can get very, very heated. It can get, uh, there can be a lot of, as I said, vitriol, a lot of intensity. And I always remind myself when I'm encountering that, that the reason this person, male, female, or otherwise is so, um, like coming at me or coming at the crowd with you have to do this and you have to treat your bees this way and you have to do it this way and there is no other way is is coming from a place of 
really wanting their bees to survive, being so invested and wanting the bees to survive. And that comes generally from a place of love. Again, not trying to reduce things down, but we have to remember that we're, we may not all agree, but we're coming from this place of real like, desire to understand or to fascination or how to be involved with these creatures. The problem is we don't always ask who they are. We don't always ask how can we listen to them and what they're already telling us and their inherent wisdom. We insert ours and put our dominant thinking over them. And this is something that takes time to learn. So that's part of what I think is the, one of the big biggest offerings that bees give us as a bridge species is, is to give us this opportunity to learn how to listen to them. And no one, including myself, even though I, I say I teach this type of thing, no one can really teach you that. I can give you suggestions, and I do. Further down the lecture series, we talk about communicating with bees, but ultimately this has to be a very personal experience. No one can teach you how to love. No one can teach you exactly how to be in relationship with your child or your parent or your partner. And it's the same with bees, learning to listen. There are skills, but ultimately it's about your relationship and your unraveling of old systemic patterns that no longer serve and the taking up of new ways within you that perhaps mirror very, very ancient remembrances of what it is to be in relationship with the bees. So we've started to cover this, right? Why do we want to keep bees or save the bees? What, where is this coming from? Obviously this love, this fascination, this mystery. Let's talk about mystery for just a second. We really don't know everything that's going on in the beehive. There has been so much research in the last uh, decade just around bees and how they live in the wild. And that's been deeply informative in how we can keep bees as beekeepers living side by side with bees, which is something we've been doing for a very, very, very long time. Um, we still can't reproduce honey. That's something only the bees can do. There's something very enigmatic about bees. And when we look back to ancient cultures, we see this, um, this real fascination with that, that interior, dark, mysterious quality of the hive. That doesn't mean people couldn't open the hive or go into the hive, but this, this sort of filing cabinet system you see here, where you can look at the hive, that, that pull, pull out um, comb like that, that wasn't really a major, I mean, that the, the way we mechanized beekeeping didn't happen until about uh, 100 years ago, um, give or take. There's, that's a, again, it's a little more complicated than that. But this fascination about what happened within the hive and that these creatures issued forth in the spring and came out of the darkness of the earth, came out of the cavities of the earth, which was deeply associated with the womb, with the mother, with life force energy, with the land of the dead or the underworld where souls regenerated. And here come the bees in the spring. And the spring is the time of abundance and the, you know, the summer fruits. They ne didn't necessarily know about pollination, although they also did know about pollination. Um, it depends on who they is. But within this, this relationship, there's this obvious connection to abundance and the mystery of life that the bees show us through their arrival in the spring. And the Greeks talked about that, uh, how that happened during the, um, this, the sunrise rising or the dawn rising of the Pleiades and that the bee season was from when the Pleiades stars, the seven sisters rose to when they set on the horizon in the fall, which I, which I love following the stars, the seven bees, the seven sisters, the seven doves, the seven fates, depending on all the various legends we can look at. So there's this mystery, this connection to abundance, to life force, to fertility, to what exists beyond the veil, beyond life. The bees seem to connect to that. And a lot of that had to do with uh, the way they seem to spontaneously appear and with them came the flowers in the spring in abundance. 
So I was in Corsica a number of years ago, um, visiting a beekeeping sanctuary, I guess you could say. Um, I wouldn't necessarily, well, yeah, it was a sanctuary. Uh, he wasn't, the beekeeper there, Dennis, wasn't bringing bees back and forth, up and down all over Corsica. He had decided to um, keep his bees in one place. And that was unusual for Corsica. Uh, Corsica is very, very famous for um, bees and honey and having these, uh, this huge range there's mountains and beaches and so bees would be moved uh, depending on the spring summer or autumn flow and i just wanted to share this quote i had from him about bees because i thought it was um it was so great in its own way so for a beekeeper to understand his wife first is of course very very difficult but when he has thousands and thousands of wives it is so difficult he kept telling me that you know the, the, you have to remember that it's the, the the females in there that it's a it's the females I call it sisterhood he called it the the women and the girls they heal the family they feed the family they build oops they build the family and you have to be nice when you go to the nest because they're with the mother not the queen the mother it's a mother um, and they are and they. <laughs> And they are, excuse me for my typos, they are her babies. Everything you do, you must do with this idea of women in the house. It is nine times easier to make the beekeeper better than to make the bee better. Nine times easier to make the beekeeper better than to make the bee better. And he was saying that piece in relationship to our attempts to continually modify and create the perfect bee, the perfect queen, the the varroa resistant queen the, the most vital queen through breeding and all, all of these various ways that we try to manipulate and so he's saying actually what, why don't we make the beekeeper better than try to change the genetics of the bees which, which i absolutely agree with great and then i wanted to show just a couple pictures of this like one of the reasons or why we connect to this the bees and in, in these these ways and one of them is a picture of a swarm this was actually the first swarm i ever caught and i think this kind of denotes that um or when we see a swarm it, it can really evoke that sense of fascination and that sense of bees are a, are a one being a super organism so part of our fascination comes uh, is centered around this super organism quality this uh reality that bees live in which is that they are a number of individual organisms that live together as one organism and that's a great concept from a human perspective but it's really hard to actually like, feel in the body or um or understand on in that like cellular level because especially now where we're very much on this individuation track and the human the, the, the individual and the individual comes first before the community obviously that's not true in all human cultures but that's very much part of the issues in in our current world order and so when we look at bees we we have always applied a lot of our highest ideals to them, the sense of a community that works together and lives together, the sense of oneness, the sense of a total being, and that is best seen in a swarm. So a swarm is when the bees reproduce in mass together and um, start a second colony. So this is a swarm when it's in its birthing process, and it's the first swarm I ever caught in a beautiful apple tree. This is a picture of what a hive that's building out its body looks like so bees aren't just the bees themselves their their totality this experience of totality is also the comb that they live on which is made of beeswax secreted from their own bodies it's the honey that flows through their veins as in the veins of the comb stored in the comb it's the pollen that's fermenting to be fed to their babies fermenting off wild yeasts mixed with bee enzymes it's the propolis, which is like a membrane made from bee enzymes and a little bit of nectar and sap from uh, trees and shrubs turned into a very potent healing 
substance that's very sticky and glue like and acts as the immune system, the immune layer around the bees. So it's this whole organism, this whole system. And as we start to befriend what it, with the bees again and get to know them again in this way of who are you, not what can I get from you, we start to see the importance of these other pieces, the importance of comb, the importance of propolis, the importance of that roundness and that ability to build their own nest. And that changes how we approach beekeeping. For instance, we perhaps stop using as much plastic foundation for the bees to build on. We let them build their own body. Um, perhaps it means we're not taking as much honey because that's their medicine and their food. Perhaps it means we're not trying to get rid of all the propolis and scrape it away because it's a nuisance. Instead, we realize that it's part of their immune system and they need it. So there's these shifts as we ask them who they are and how do they live best in the wild and how do they overcome things like parasites and the, you know, the varroa mite and all these big bad things affecting the bees. Um, how do they somehow survive that in the wild, which they, they are and they do. Uh, this gives us answers into how we can be better beekeepers and better earth tenders. And the sense of the sacred continues well into today. So although ancient cultures um, had, had, you know, all sorts of associations with the divine and bees, uh, that doesn't mean it, it, it ended there. So we see it today. This is um, just a, a beautiful gesture of one of my, one of my friends honoring the bees. Um, it comes from more of a Buddhist uh, Zen Buddhism lineage, and this is, or belief system, and this is what he's doing to support and honor the bees. Um, this is, by the way, a sun hive on the left, um, which is a round structure for the bees, and then a golden hive, or the golden, yeah, golden hive on the right, I believe. There's also this... Uh, honoring of the bees through being devotional in our the nests we create for them or the spaces we create for them to have their nest um, their home this is from the sacred trust in england which is where uh, i studied bee shamanism for a decade and this is one of their hives you'll find uh, folk art and painting of hives uh, across some of the especially eastern european beekeeping practices So why else do we want to save or keep the bees? Connection to life force and generative energy. I started to touch on this a moment ago. Honeybees have very, very much been associated with life and death and regeneration. And when we look at one of the cultures that held bees in high esteem, ancient, the ancient Mediterranean cultures, basically Greece, Anatolia, uh, even the Romans, we see this association association with um, pre-patriarchal goddesses who could self-create, so autogenic or parthenogenic goddesses. One of the most famous, um, I think, is Artemis of Ephesus in what is now, um, Ephesus was in modern-day Turkey, it's the city of the bees, or was the city of the bees. And the Artemis there was the Lady of the Wild, the Lady of the Beasts. I'll have a photo of her in a second. Um, predating the Artemis as twin to Apollo and Huntress. So very, very old Artemis connected to uh, midwifery, to abundance, to fertility, et cetera, et cetera. But she was an autogenic goddess, meaning she created herself. And this idea of spontaneously birthing oneself. We see it again in the Demeter um, Corey myth. If we look at the pre-patriarchal, pre-pantheon of the gods story, this idea of one can, one can um, duplicate oneself, rebirth, rebirth oneself. Parthenogenesis meaning virgin birth. So a divine birth is another way to talk about it. This was is seen in um, how bees seem to spontaneously split, swarm, and self-regenerate and become an entirely new colony. So the mother colony goes off with the queen to continue on and create a new, new colony and the daughter colony stays behind and nobody dies, both, both colonies continue. And so there is this renewal, this ever renewing energy, which was often associated with the goddess, with the feminine or the divine feminine, the mother energy, the earth, that which um, creates life 
and we die back into the earth and are reborn again. So the cycle of regeneration and life force. So bees are very much connected to that. And we see that in swarming. We see that in the relationship they have to flowers, to pollination, to um, the vitality and vibrance and beauty of the earth. So here are a few pieces about bees and fertility. As I've said, in ancient Greece, there's an association with fertility goddesses and goddesses of childbirth or midwifery. So one of them, the uh, one goddess we can talk about is Aletheia. She had a cave, the cave of bees, one of the caves of bees, there were more than one, on Crete. And women would come to her cave and offer jars of honey. It was said that bees also lived in her cave and she presided over birth and um, she was the divine midwife. She became associated with Artemis in the future. So Artemis is also even the modern, more modern Artemis associated with the pantheon of the gods, uh, the Olympian gods. She was also a midwife. And these birthing caves are um, also associated with the birth of divine gods, such as Zeus, who was born in a who was secreted away, perhaps, and or born in a birthing cave filled with bees and then tended to by the Melissa, which is the uh, Greek word for bee. So the Melissa bees as bee nymphs, bee maidens, or bee priestesses. You hear this again with Dionysus when he was um, dismembered, torn to pieces, and reborn. In his rebirth, he was raised on honey intended to by these nymphs, the bees. Again, I've, I've already spoken of it. We have Anatolia, the Artemis of Ephesus the, at the city of bees. Even the coins coming from uh, Ephesus were had bees on them, some of them. Ancient Greece isn't the only place we see connection between bees and fertility. I think one of the great anecdotal pieces around European practices, particularly Anglo-Saxon and Scandinavian, but you find it in other places as well, is the honeymoon. So honeymoon wasn't always just a vacation to some place that was probably too expensive. <laughs> a honeymoon was a period of time, one moon, one moon cycle, where the newlywed couple would be given enough mead to last for one moon with the hopes that that honey wine would help ensure the fertility of the couple and the beginning of new life. You also have um, Ashtesia. I'm not sure if I'm pronoun pronouncing that correctly. She is a Lithuanian bee goddess and mother of the bees who, surprise, surprise, watched over newly engaged women in particular and pregnant women. If you are interested in some of the art in ancient cultures connected to bees, I highly recommend reading um, works by Maria Gambutas. So here is a depiction of the Artemis of Ephesus. She is often shown in long skirts and there are usually bee motifs on her skirts, which you can see here. It's hard to tell, but it's also in, in this one, there's a bee right there, a bee right there. And then here you have two bee skeps, which were the old uh, bee hive. Oh, Maria Gumbutas. Um, <laughs> I don't have the book right next to me. Gods and Goddesses of Old Europe is a good place to start. That's the to answer the question in the chat. Lots of people have wondered what these um, seemingly many breasted pods are. I don't know exactly how to talk about them. Um, some theories are that they were either bee eggs or pollen pouches. So food for thought, potentially bee eggs or pollen pouches. So this is Artemis as the lady of the beast, lady of the beasts, meaning uh, patroness to all of the wild things. Thank you, Kaisia, Kaisa, sorry, Maria Gambutas. Yeah. Okay, moving along. We only have four hours of material left to go today. Oh, come now. There we go. What else is this? What, uh, why do we want to keep bees? How, why do we want to save the bees? What else is going on? Um, 
the effect of bees and beekeeping on our brains and our nervous systems. So this is an area of study, but I'll talk about it anecdotally. Bees have been worked with, um, many people have experienced the effect of bees on their nervous systems, as in the sound of the hive and being around bees and the act of beekeeping calms the nervous system, unless of course you're very afraid of bees. And part of that is the sound itself, uh, the effect on the brain waves. In fact, in um, Slovenia, in Europe, there's a folk practice that has continued on today of bee huts where people are able to go into an interior structure, into a little wooden hut, and lay on a bed. And underneath the bed are beehives. So that you're not actually in with the bees, but they're underneath the hive. In fact, I've even seen like Airbnbs like this, right? <laughs> pun, pun intended, I guess. Um, and you can sleep with the subtle vibration sound and scent of the hive, which is considered to be very therapeutic and is even used in schools to help calm some, calm children or in, um, yeah, in schools. The wor uh, working with bees has also been utilized by vets going through uh, PTSD. Um, it's been used in prison programs. It's a, what happens when you have to slow down when you have to be so focused with the bees, move slower, pay attention. You have to you have to enter into a different state of mind. And I argue that the scent of the hive and the sound of the hive also affects that slightly altered state of being. Most people don't realize how altered they are until they take off the veil or whatever they're doing and go back inside. And then they're suddenly like, wow, that's, I was kind of in another place. It's the same place people might go to um, if they're a very adept musician and they're deep in their music or an artist. It's this this um, shift in how your brain is functioning and this, this depth of focus and attention and presence that um, is, is hard to describe until you're actually sitting with the bees. And you don't have to be a beekeeper to experience it. Just sitting next to a hive can bring this altered state into being. I would also say accompanying that is a sense of pleasure. So the sensory experience of being around bees, again, sound, smell, sight, watching them come and go can be really, really, really enjoyable. The taste of honey, uh, all of these things, they connect us to our senses, but in particular to our sense of pleasure. And we, we forget that pleasure is not just something reserved for, um, sexual experiences, eros is in all things, and pleasure can be experienced through something as simple as the sound of a beehive. In fact, again, people have worked with putting stethoscopes or tubes into beehives just so they can sit there and listen to the beehive. Back to Slovenia and other European, um, mostly Eastern European and, and I think Germany a little bit, practices of um, putting a tube into the hive and putting a mask on and actually inhaling the scent of the hive to cure things like asthma and respiratory illnesses. It, you know, it's a, it's not approved here in the United States yet, but it's a thing. Um, but anyway, we can connect to this, this inherent pleasure in the sensory experience of being around bees. And then there's the emotional experience. So most likely if you ever end up getting bees or you find a hive or you're around the hives, you will start to form an emotional bond. And that emotional experience is one of our pathways of learning. It's one of our pathways of kinship and reconnecting to the bees. When I have students come to me in tears because they've lost a hive, it, it's, it, to me it's such a celebratory moment because we, it shows that we are reconnecting with the bees. It's not just this, you know, oh, I lost, I lost a hive and therefore I lost some income and I, um, and like darn, I'll have to start again. It's this deeper sense of kinship and a personality and a being that you had in your life that is no longer with us. And so that kind of emotional experience, even the loss of the bees, touching that grief is absolutely part of reconnecting ourselves to the bees. Um, if you're interested in, in grief work around nature, um, 
and our relationship to the natural world, check out Joanna Macy's work. Joanna Macy's. Also, Sobon Fusome. So emotional experience can also include states of euphoria, uh, tr true joy and abundance. I've, I've talked to students who have been having just like the worst week and then they go and sit with their bees on a spring day and smell the honey and see the coming and going of the bees and something settles, a sense of all is well, all is right in the world. I am here with the bees, the bees are coming and going and, and it just shifts, things can shift. Um, and then from personal experience, bees kind of saved my life. I'm not going to tell the whole story now, but um, I was three months pregnant when I miscarried and had a surgical, um, had to go into surgery and it was very traumatic. Um, and one week later, I, 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 I was very traumatized and I prayed to the bees to come to me so that I could at least connect with mothering something. And they did. A week later, I started beekeeping for the first time. I caught that first swarm. And being with them and that, that quality of presence, that Zen mind, that emotional connection, that sense of their growing quality, their growing nest, expanding and expanding, brought me back into my body when I was, I was very much floating off. I was, not, um, I was not okay. And they tethered me back to the seasons, back to the earth, back to life and abundance and regeneration. And it's interesting that that first hive was the hive I did the least with, also messed up the most with, and yet it survived the longest of all of my colonies. So, yeah. And then connection to nature, which is in some ways what it's all about for me. Um, bridging our relationship between this this human experience and what we perceive a perceive as nature. This is a photograph of one of my favorite places I've ever been to. It's an apiary and a home and a garden. Um, it's uh, part of the Natural Beekeeping Trust in the UK and you see six hives there, three on the ground and three on top of the little uh, bee hut where uh, you open those doors and it's just a bed that you can sleep out with the bees and listen to their hum. What else is possible as we connect with the bees? Uh, we can connect with the sense of our, our own liminal nature and nonlinear nature. Uh, those, those places where we go in between, where one reality is here and another reality is there, and we're somehow in between. Uh, we can connect to what we perceive as the feminine principle. Um, again, going back to some of those old associations with the bees and the divine feminine, and also the fact that a beehive is made up of predominantly sisters and, a, and daughters and a mother, although there are wonderful drones in there as well. And connection to the inherent eros in nature, which I often describe as the, um, the witnessing of a bee absolutely just in love with a flower, rolling in it, collecting the pollen, drinking the nectar, feeling the light, the warmth, the sun, the color. So that quality of our love affair with the with the world and we see it in the bees with their love affair with the flowers and then bees as a bridge so what do bees bridge in us bees help us bridge between nature and human between how we perceive nature and how we perceive ourselves as separate then between life and death again bees being connected to souls coming and going from from the world between the soul and the body, between the wild and the domestic, between this world and the spirit world, between interdependence and independence. Let's take a look at some of these. So as I've said all along, nature doesn't exist outside of ourselves, but rather we are an aspect of the earth looking back on ourselves. So when we talk about connecting to nature, we often think of that as like, here I am and I want to have nature connection and nature's out there. And I live in downtown Oakland and um, nature has got to be somewhere that I got to drive to because it's not here. And that is true. Getting into more, you know, forests, fields, seas, the sea, the lakes, the rivers, absolutely. But we have to remember that we are also grown of the earth and that we are part of the earth and that we are perhaps the earth dreaming and we can dream ourselves into um, greater kinship and uh, 
connection and relationship with the earth. So part of it starts with this worldview, shifting of this worldview. And that's, that's really where I got started. I got started in anthropology and, uh, and whatnot in college. And that led me to eco-psychology and this idea that uh, we are remembering ourselves as part of the living earth and part of the world of spirit. When I talk about spirit, I don't mean something that's out there in the cosmos, although that it's included, but the spirit, uh, to talk about it in the sense of the other world and the Celts, the way the Celts talk about the other world, the spirit is that which is all around us at all times. Spirit of the rocks, spirit of the grass, spirit of a landscape, of a mountain, of a river, the spirit of our home, the spirit of our business, that this animate world is here and ready to talk to us and speak to us in, um, in, in nonlinear ways. From Matthew White, the European Center of Environment and Human Health. Nature is not only nice to have, but it is a have to have for physical health and cognitive function. So bees, being a bridge species, help us have that experience. Even if we're keeping bees on the rooftop of a major city, we are connecting to what's outside and the seasons, the smell of the earth they uh, what's blooming what's not blooming i believe i have a slide on that let's get to it yeah so beekeeping helps us get outside it's help us it helps us tune ourselves to the seasons what's happening what's uh how, you know how early is the spring this year how late is the spring this year when are the flowers coming when is the nectar flow happening uh nectar flow is how we talk about when something is in bloom that the bees love and it's a big flow and they're getting a lot of food from it it, again, brings more awareness to what's blooming and what's dying away. Brings more awareness to climate change on a local level, which again is really important. We have to see what's happening on the local level to want to be involved with it on a global level. And bees localize us. They help us connect to place. And I think it's really, really important, especially when, for instance, you're someone who might identify as really loving nature in the countryside, but you are in a city and you don't have the availability to just be in, in nature all the time. If you, if you can keep bees on a rooftop or in a small allotment somewhere, you're going to start to feel the pulse of the natural world happening all around you, pushing up through the cracks in the pavement, flying above you as flocks of birds or those, uh, you know, hawks that certainly love a good, a good city park. Uh, they, they bring you into your relationship to where you are right now. And that's, again, really important because when we're localized to place with the natural world, we, we don't romanticize it as something outside as much or way over there. We start to become friends with that one tree, that one type of flower that blooms every spring. And we've noticed that it always shows up around my, you know, your birthday or whatever it is, or your, your, um, you know, you, you have a personal association with it. So that, that saying hello, that quality of recogn recognition and saying hello and, and how the bees help tie us to that because, oh, look, the irises are blooming. I wonder if that's food for the bees. Maybe I'll go look it up. That kind of thing. Connecting you, connecting the dots, creating relationship. So bees drinking from a little stream our inheritance to be tasked with remembering the wisdom of our earth honoring ancestors and to bridge this wisdom with the tools of modernity to restore not just the earth but also our way of relating to the earth so how can we be borrowing from something deep in our bones that remembers what it's like to live in congruence with the earth but also remaining fully in this world here and now and not just romanticizing the past and I think part of that is through being present with what's happening seasonally, year to year. And one of the ways we can presence to that is working with bees. You just can't get away from it. If you're with the bees, you're going to notice the weather. That's for sure. Because 
they aren't going to fly on a rainy day. And if it's too cold and snowy outside and there's been a huge storm, you're going to have to go out and brush off their entrance so that they can fly, et cetera, et cetera, when it warms up. You're just going to be re connecting to what's happening. If it's too hot, you're going to want to check on your bees, make sure they have shade, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing that bees do is they bridge us between the wild and the domestic. And um, don't let anybody ever tell you that bees are, are domesticated and that there are no wild bees left. It's just not true. Bees can and will swarm, as in birth themselves, from a human-made cavity and go land on a tree somewhere and find a new tree hollow if there is habitat available or perhaps a chimney or a barn and start a whole new colony and live quote unquote wild without human intervention. So bees help us connect to that within ourselves. They sit between our sense of domesticated animals, cats, dogs, livestock, and wild animals. And they help us feel that flow and that relationship between that part of ourselves that is domesticated and the part of ourselves that is still wild. Wild being a concept more than anything. I've talked about swarms already, but um, again, touching back on this idea that bees can be, can always stay wild. This is how they do so, right? If they were to swarm out of your bee box and land in a, land in a tree, and inhabit a new tree hollow or cave somewhere, they would do it because it's, it's part of their inherent nature. So it's their way of reproducing. They reproduce when an old queen or the mother leaves the hive with about three quarters of her daughters in the spring. They cluster like this on a nearby branch gathering around the queen. Scout bees go out looking for a new home. When they find one, all the bees choose it. They vote on it together. If you want to read about that, read Tom Seeley's book, Honey Bee Democracy. And then they off they go and they start a new colony. They start to build comb, bring in honey. Back at the old hive, a new queen is born and thus two colonies now exist, a mother colony and a daughter colony. This is a photograph of the first swarm I ever caught. The one that saved my life. Hmm. Checking on time. I want to leave some time for Q&A. A little bit longer. And then a little bit about bees as a, as a bridge between this world and the spirit world. First and foremost, before I get into that, part of our restore, part of restoring our relationship to bees involves connecting with the uh, bees on an emotional, heart-centered, and even sacred or spiritual level. However, you do not need to self-identify as a spiritual or religious person to have profound encounters with bees or the spirit of the bee. So we're talking about how the sacred shows up in intimate relationship with the bees, not just our um, sort of association or decision to see them as sacred. I think that we have sacred encounters um, all the time. We just might not label them as such. So just recognizing that um, that, it, that might be happening within you, whether or not you identify as spiritual or religious. So, Bees are a bridge to the other world. They're a bridge to spirit. Again, spirit being animate, being that which is in the trees and the rocks and the, the stars and the sea. Um, in many cultures, in ancient cultures for sure, there is a sense of an afterlife or an underworld or an other world where the soul goes to and comes from. And that the bees can traverse that. They're either located in the other world or they can go between the other world. They can bring souls to and from the other world. They are the souls coming to and from the other world. And or they have, um, you know, th they're in the ear of the gods. So they can be the messenger that connects a prophet or a prophetess to the gods. Um, and, and bring forth prophecy. So bees were associated with fertility, with prophecy, um, with so divine truth, with um, poetry, and uh, with death, life and death. In North mythology, and I'm going to butcher how to pronounce the name, but Hedron, the goat at the base of the world tree, lovely goat at the base of the world tree, offered honey wine, so mead, from her udders rather than milk. 
The exalted warriors of Valhalla, the fallen warriors of Valhalla, drank this mead. So this was their food of the gods. In the Celtic otherworld, or paradise, the rivers run with mead. Again, run with honey wine. Mead was one of the first alcohols, possibly the first alcohol to ever exist. So it's um, quite old, definitely older than wine of the grape. These are seen as tears that come from the eyes of Christ, that he cried tears, and those tears are, became bees, and that was the origin story of bees. This originates from the myth of the Egyptian god Ra, or Re, and his tears also turning into bees once they hit the ground. In Greek mythology, bees are both priestesses and nymphs, nymphs being part divinity, part woman. The bee nymphs, known as the Thriae, Thriae talk to Apollo, the god Apollo um, taught Apollo the art of prophecy, but only tr but they only spoke true when fed honey. And it was actually Apollo who installed himself as the divine godhead at Delphi, where the priestess at Delphi spoke um, spoke prophecy and was known as the Delphic bee. And the priestesses who attended the temple there were known as the Melissa. So um, once patriarchy came on in and the pantheon of the gods was established the temple became the temple of Apollo. Prior to that, it was dedicated to chthonic or earthly um, energies and goddesses such as Python and Gaia. Bees bring spirits into incarnation. Uh, swallowing a bee in a European, in, uh, was a European folk tradition used to ensure pregnancy and that was found in many different places. In Wales, bees were believed to be the only animal that came directly from paradise. The Greeks thought pure souls departed in the form of bees. The Celts thought especially pure souls were bees coming in. And the Greek prophetess at Delphi was known as the Delphic bee, as I've already said, and it was believed that um, the divine, the Python or Apollo, spoke through her. Again, connection to bees. Bees were also seen as um, guides into the underworld and into liminal spaces or places between. So such as a cave, a place between the upper world and the lower world. Uh, again, referring to Greek mythology. This is the Delphic Omphalos stone that was found that was found at Delphi and of course associated with um, the cult at Delphi and the, the, the prophecy. It was talked of, spoken of as the navel of the world and has often been associated with bees being seen as a um, beehive shape and being covered in a motif that looks like a net of bees. And then I'll very briefly touch on the fact that I come from uh, European, like my teachings are informed by European bee shamanism. And this is a tradition that um, is sometimes called path of pollen. It has older roots than that particular name although it's more widely known as the Path of Pollen now, and it has its roots in Celtic Britain, Lithuania, and ancient Greece, of course, or can, can follow itself back to ancient Greece. Of course, there's no, there's no book, there's no exact um, origin story that I can tell you. Um, this is a folk tradition that's been passed down from mouth to ear, or auditorially over time, and was very hidden for, for quite a long time, very small, taught in small groups of six um, until uh, the elders of that tradition were asked, asked my teachers to teach it um, to the wider public. But within that uh, tradition, and again, shamanism is a little bit of a tricky word to use, but we're talking about an animistic culture. So uh, you know, shamanism is a word that's been appropriated through um, anthropologists from the peoples of Northern Siberia. Um, nonetheless, it is a word that's been adopted that talks about um, various cultures that have a relationship to the spirit world and to the earth and can travel between this world and the other world um, and, and have you know, an understanding that the, everything is animate, everything has spirit. So in bee shamanism, bees are seen as a bridge between this world and the animate spirit world. Bees and the Melissa the bee women are lovers of liminality or threshold locations, places between. 
The glyph of the bee is known as the lemniscate and is the central symbol and informative teacher and ally. It's also the shape new bees fly in when they're orienting to their hive and the shape bees dance in when they're dancing within their hive to communicate a food source or a new home. There's an idea that we all possess an interior garden of roses and stars that connects to our glandular system, our endocrine system, and can secrete nectars, um, creating an interior alchemy or nectary. This system is a system of eight interior roses and stars, uh, similar to other systems that are associated with energy centers in the body. And I'm just going to briefly stop the share and make sure, yeah, we're almost up. So, hold on one second before you go. Whoops. It always takes me a second to figure out this whole thing. Um, there we go. Yeah, I will, I will stop there. I go into, I have a few more slides about ways that we can start to connect with bees um, as particular beekeeping and there's sort of a, a prelude to um, some of my other lectures around actually connecting with hives. So I have two lectures, one about connecting with the bees at the hive and one about connecting with the bees away from the hive. And I always try to fit in more than I can. I wanted to throw that in there, um, but I'm not going to. I think the last thing I'll say is that while there are all these folk connections and religious connections between bees, and, and again, that's a whole long, long, long topic. I'm working on a class just on that. Um, we also see this connection in the fossil rec record and particularly in uh, nutritional recon reconstruction of the nutritional diet of the Homo sapiens and well, us and the Neanderth Neanderthals and those who came before. And it's been found that um, with the advent of stone tools and smoke and being able to smoke out hives, there is an uptick in the ability to consume honey. And honey is, a, um, is one of the purest, most unadulterated f food that exists that supports brain development. And it is believed that one of the contributing factors to our evolution into humans, as we know ourselves today, into Homo sapiens, was the boost we received from eating more honey, larva, and pollen. So all of these legends are beautiful, but I also ask, is it possible that somewhere deep, 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 deep in our collective genetic memory is this kinship and this recognition that the bees helped us get where we are today that they are in some ways part of our ancient ancestry and supported us in our evolution and perhaps just maybe the bells that they're ringing right now to call the attention to what's happening to habitat food sources the planet the bees is inviting us to evolve again and step into what we can become in support of all living things. Thank you, and I am complete. I will open the doors to questions. I do hope that that gave you a taste into our relationship to bees, both past and present. And um, yeah, hopefully that topic will continue to flower and unfold for you. I could spend years talking about the various nuances that we've touched on. So. I hope that that was supportive. Um, please uh, put your questions in the chat, if at all possible, so that I can um, see them. Uh, or you can raise your hand using the reactions button. And the reactions button is the bottom of the screen. A little smiley face. Just put a little hand up if you want to ask a question or say something or comment. Can you direct me to resources to learn more about the practice of telling the bees? Yes, one of them is going to be my lecture um, on communicating with bees at the hive. And um, so that's one resource. It's kind of one of those here, there, and everywhere things uh, for resources for telling the bees. There's a few articles I can think of. 
Um, I think one of your better resources out there for bees and folklore, um, this is again why I could teach, why I will be teaching a whole class on this kind of stuff, um, is, and this is not a plug to do that, I just am saying because my brain is exploding with too many facts and anecdotes, uh, but one good resource is Hilda Ransom's book, um, which is about bees and ancient folklore. I don't see it next to me, so that's one place that you can find more about telling the bees. Very briefly, if you're wondering what that means, it's the act of actually speaking to the bees and speaking at the hive to the bees, which uh, is, a, is a practice that still goes on today, especially in places like Ireland and England, and um, has earliest written history going back to 16th century, but obviously goes back before that. Yeah, so that's something I cover. Um, and I'll, I'll actually share the, the meditation that I was taught through bee shamanism at the Sacred Trust that is a variant, I guess you could say, of that. That's a way to connect with the bees. Um, Hilda Ransom. And I will um, direct you all to my resources page on my website where I have some of these books. So uh, recommended. Some of these books recommended. It's in the chat now. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Finding a swarm. Uh, so thank you so much, Ariella. I'm curious about finding a swarm, selecting a way to f um, fill a hive. So the best way to open up to start a hive um, is to find a swarm, if at all possible, although there are other ways. And um, I'm trying to make this chat go bigger one second. Pop out. There we go. Um, the best way that I've found, honestly, is either join a local beekeeping association and get yourself on something called a swarm call list. Put it out there to your friends and neighbors. Let them know that you're looking to catch a swarm and what a swarm is. And um, if you're in, a bear, in an area that seems to do have a lot of beekeepers and, and bees, you can put up something called in a tree or up on a higher location, something called a swarm trap or bait hive not my favorite words to use but if you want to talk beekeeping language that's what they're called swarm traps bait hives and they're meant to potentially lure a swarm um, and then you take them down from that tree and put in their little hive and put it into your hive so those are some resources for you um yeah any other oh summer why don't you go for it Hi there. Um, I was wondering if in the lecture series or um, if not in the lecture series and if there's just a resource or I keep imagining for established beekeepers and bee tenders um, uh, conversations around how to be tending and uh, I guess evolving and tending with the climate instability of just sort of problem solving around their care because we're since Seasons seem very interrupted. So. I see a bumblebee every day. <laughs> That's good. We love those bumblebees. Good old bumblebees. They're called, um, in old, old English, they're called Dumbledores. So it turns out one of the best wizards in the world is named Bumblebee. The, in our hover near my mom's sauna, and I collect flowers and put them in the Great. Hover. So you're helping. To answer your question, um, no, I don't know of a good resource for people actively talking about climate change and bees and how to resource ourselves and care for the bees in climate change. I actually don't see enough people talking about this at all. And I think the first first thing is that it, it's challenging as a global thing because it's it's so local. Like what I'm dealing with in California on wildfires is going to be very different than, for instance, extended ice storms on the East Coast or something like that. Um, you know, fruit trees are blooming too early here. I had another um, some, someone on Instagram talk about how their uh, hazel trees in Sweden are blooming too early there. And so it's it does have to be local. Um, I think that's a really great idea. Um, definitely finding it away is like, where can that happen? Uh, but I don't have a resource to send you to. Any other questions coming up for anyone? Hmm, Catherine, you're getting a beehive. Um, great, yeah. 
brown bees. Yeah, there are different kinds of local bees. Um, I remember in England, they were really excited about finding black bees, Corsican black bees, another thing. So these different local species. Isabel. Hi, um, first of all, thank you for doing this. So my question, it's a little bit more abstract, but I do honeybee research and I'm also a beekeeper. And so I'm very ingrained in the world of academia when it comes to beekeeping. Um, but I also feel much more compelled to the kind of spiritual side of beekeeping. And I'm just curious, like how you've best found to bridge the gap between those things or balance um, kind of like the more scientific and academic world of beekeeping knowledge mm -hmm. versus the more like spiritual and um, folklore based. I honestly find for myself that one supports the other. Um, it's kind of like how sometimes as you go into biology, you find the divine. Um, like st the more I study bees scientifically or, or learn about them through academic research, the more I f personally just feel that connection of like their magnificence. So I think when we allow both to be true, um yeah i i think we can really benefit from academic and scientific knowledge and you know as a beekeeper in any of my classes you're never going to find me just going to the spiritual or just going to the sacred because it, it that basically starts to look like spiritual bypassing around what's actually happening with the bees. Like we, we have to understand them biologically. We have to understand what's happening to them on a climate level. We have to talk about them from an academics perspective as well as the, the sacred and, and both can exist at the same time. I think also really recognizing that, um, you know, spirit, whatever spirit is speaks to us through the language of poetry, uh, metaphor, imagination, and that we can go as far out there as we want with our imagination with the bees, um, and still at the same time anchor in, you know, grounded knowledge about their biology and their behavior. Um, so we, we can have these metaphors that have personal meaning, and still look at them as as their own biological organism and not just project and anthropomorphize onto them it's it's being both and being of both worlds and and actively choosing to do that does that kind of answer your question definitely and i think that is like one of the major things that drew me into beekeeping is that like they do inherently exist alongside each other and that's i have i also do like um, ecosystem restoration and a lot of other things where I think that there is more divorce between the two. So I think that is why beekeeping has long time encapsulated my attention. Well, that's the whole point for me is that, be that bees can be a bridge because we created this split that academics means no spirit academics means nothing sacred that it's 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 this you know it's scientific method and it's this and that and it's it's very scholarly and it's very rigid and all and that. That's not true. <laughs> yeah, we, we can connect um, with the bees as a way to play with what it is to have multiple truths at the same time. Yeah, great. I'm so excited. I'd love to hear more about your research. Um, Ariel asked, what are my thoughts on mason bees living in close community with honey bees? Did you all know that you can get bee hotels and make bee hotels? That's what they're called. These little huts that have different tiny cavities for solitary bees that live one bee at a time down a little shoot of bamboo or a little pine cone cavity or something like that. Um, I highly recommend them as a great way to start with bees because beekeeping is kind of expensive and prohibitive for a lot of people. Um, again, we can get into all sorts of, well, we could talk about privilege, but that's not the topic today. Um, little bee huts and bee houses you can make on your own pretty easily and invite native pollinators back. Native pollinators, mason bees, live great next to honeybees if there is enough food. So plant for pollinators. That's the main thing. Honeybees only outcompete native pollinators when there's a shortage of food for everybody. 
and I think the better, the more we get into bees, the more we get into the like honeybees, the more we get into all bees. So, yeah, they can live together. I've got time for a few more questions if you need to go, because we're at the at the ending point. By all means, see you later. Um, I will send this out to you uh, via email on Monday, so you have this to enjoy to share with other people and whatnot. Um, I tried to make the lecture series really affordable, um, but if if you're someone who's wanting to do it and it's just not in your ability, please reach out to me um, because it's more about having a resource for you than about um, anything else because yeah, I, I teach longer classes and stuff like that. These lectures are really meant to be accessible. Okay, any other questions coming up? Cool. You can also um, send questions via Instagram or drop them in the chat and I can answer them on Instagram. And otherwise, thank you for dipping your toes in the water with me in this giant topic that I tried to cover in something like 70 minutes. I will see you if you're continuing on in the series with me. Um, if not, best of journey with you, your bees, pollination, the earth, and falling back in love in all the tiny ways that we can and we do um, start by saying hello next time you see a bee. It's a great way to begin that relationship. See you later and be well, everyone. Take care. <laughs>